Obviously, we haven't gotten the full, uh, uh, the full dollars from CFE. We did not get, CUNY did not keep pace with state spending as we revealed today, $637 million difference. That's pretty significant. That's over a half a billion dollars that CUNY did not get despite uh, the lack of funding. That is an incredible institution, but you have to invest capital money, you have to invest programmatic money, you have to invest in the professors, you have to invest in the students. And when we do that, and I would say that for SUNY and CUNY, you know, we turn out some of the best and the brightest, most diverse school populations that go on to do great things uh, for the world. And I think we should make that a priority in the budget. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kruger. Thank you. Senator Savino? Oh, no, I have Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have one? Excuse me. I thought you were done. No, I thought so, too. Mr. McDonald. <laughs> you told me you By were way, done. We have three and a half hours to go. Right. right. <laughs> I'll only take up two. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. So, McDonald? So, um, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Savino. We have an assembly member oh, who is a okay. that we were not aware of. So you're assembly. next after that. I'll be quick, Controller. And, and for reference, I replaced your colleague, Ron Canisteri. So I represent five cities, Cohoes, Waterville, Rensselaer, Troy, and the city of Albany. So, and being a former mayor, I think you understand some of the context of my questions. But uh, the mayor earlier, when you sat through the five-hour presentation, had referenced a $600 million increase in our pension costs. And the one question I meant to ask but stepped out, is the fund 90%, 100% funded. Where is the pension fund in regards to its New York responsibilities? City? New York City pension fund? New York City, yeah, not New York City. So New York City. we're roughly, we're, a, we're, we are, we're at 155 billion. We're the fourth largest uh, pension fund in the United States. We're actually the 14th largest in the world. Uh, we protect the retirement security of 710,000 people. So it really is an incredible mm -hmm. responsibility we have. Our, we're about 71% funded. Okay. We are not. Uh, we are. We are in a strong position. There's a lot more that we have to do. You know, our pension fund is made up of five boards. We better aligned our pension fund. Uh, thanks to the hard work of the trustees, we are now going to have one investment meeting. People should know that. Today, um, you know, we are releasing a report by an independent consultant talking about uh, the Bureau of Asset Management that I run and the wholesale reform that's needed to bring the system into the 21st century. And we are slowly but consistently working with the trustees to create the opportunity so that when the economy is good, we can take advantage, as you know, mm -hmm. take advantage of you know, the markets and all that we have to invest in. And then when, we, when there are tough times, we have enough risk officers and a risk plan in place to hedge against a tough economy, and that is my goal as control. You were earlier, and, and I agree with it, when they were talking about how many res how much reserves should New York City have, and how, many what? how much reserves New York City should have, and every wise controller will say there's never enough reserves, and, and then you, you gave a very appropriate answer. Uh, what's your goal in regards to the pension? Where, where do you want to be in three to five years percentage-wise? Or in terms, of, in, uh, in terms of the cushion for the city? in regards to the pension fund. In other words, you know, you're at 71% right now. I mean, the state is running at a little bit higher rate. What's the goal with the city pension fund? You know, rather, rather than get to the end game, which of course is to be fully funded in, in, a, right. in, a, in a perfect world, uh, my, my goal is that we reduce the reliance of taxpayer dollars going into the pension fund to make, to, uh, make up shortfalls. I think it's critical that we hit our actuarial target. It's, uh, it, it's very critical to us that we, we get there and we get there um, making sure that our asset classes are, you know, our asset, different asset classes are, you know, are, are much more moderate. I wouldn't, I never want to use the word conservative, but I actually find myself um, more conservative recognizing that we don't have to hit it big. Right? Our goal is to be responsible long-term investors hit our 7%, do it in, the, in, in a way that safeguards uh, you know, these individuals' retirement. You know, pensions, the average pension is under $40,000. This is people's total retirement. That and Social Security in New York City doesn't, even pay, doesn't pay the rent. And uh, so it's a very crucial part. Absolutely. I think it's actually the, the biggest part of our job is to think about this every day. Yep, I agree, and, and I appreciate what you're doing. 
The other is more of a comment. Um, I know you went to great pains to put it in your presentation. Obviously, the mayor was asked questions about it several times with the star C bond refinancing. And you know, I, and I appreciate your comments. And probably the first thing I did when I was a mayor was went through and refinanced all my old debt too, for what we could do. And, and it brought about an appreciable savings. Um, at the same token, I think the challenge here, and this is just a comment, and mostly I'm saying it for the people who are taking notes, not you, is that um, many of our cities are struggling financially. Fortunately, many of them have not gone to that depth of, of debt that the city has seen. And at the same token, they're all looking for solutions. They're all looking for ways to avoid going into debt. You know, you'll be hearing from the mayor of Albany and the mayor of Troy very soon, and they're very much on that, that decline. And um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of resources being directed to prevent that from happening. So I think when Senator Kennedy was grilling the mayor and a few others, um, they, were, they were appropriate. I, I share that concern. I, I, we need all of New York State to be successful. I understand there's always going to be friction between the city and the state on, you know, we won on this one, we lost on this one. It's, it's, like, it's a very large scorecard. At the end of the day, I just hope that everybody has an open mind to recognize the fact that we need to make sure we're all strong financially. You know, one of, the, one of the things I learned in my, you know, 13 years in Albany is that the world does not only revolve around your local district, right? There's a much bigger world out there. You know, you have Magnarelli in Syracuse and, you know, people who I serve with who represented big cities with just the same struggles and challenges New York City faces. You know, I actually think these hearings, though they're, obviously there's a certain ideology, there's certain, there's a certain natural upstate, downstate friction, it, it, at the end of the day, if the state is doing badly and only New York does well, it's not good for New York. People stay away from our state. The tourists don't come. It, it, we, we are so linked together, even though we don't always see it right away. And I would hope that in this budget process, I come here you know, as control of fighting for my city, but it is not at the expense of Syracuse or Rochester, the big five. It's not you know, against any city or town. We gotta do this, we gotta do this together. And, and I think you heard that from the mayor today. He came here today not talking only about us, but making sure that we could figure out a way to get everyone where we need to be. Look, some years there will be a crisis in your community that will, that will allow us to take away from our city. That has happened time and time again. It's gonna happen again. We're here to tell you that we do have some real issues in New York City that we have got to deal with to keep the engine going. It's education, it's homelessness. <laughs> These are issues that, you know, beyond the glittering city, I just wanna take you back to our invisible city. 58,000 people, 23,000 children. Man, they're gonna be sleeping in shelters. No child should sleep in those situations. We're gonna inspect, we're gonna blow the whistle, but we also need the programmatic money and the strategy to clean them up. And if we clean them up, we're gonna make taxpayers out of these children, we're gonna educate them, they're gonna have productive lives, and then we can dismantle. You know, the goal is to dismantle our shelter system. Wouldn't it be great if we only needed one shelter, right? Maybe, you know, one shelter per borough, and that's just because we need, you know, we need to keep bad things happen. Right now, we've got, uh, we've got an absolute mess, years in the making, the mayor's right, this didn't happen overnight. And now's the time for us to, to tackle it for the sake of the whole state. Thank you for the good work that you're doing. I, I do have to say, from an upstater perspective, the whole, all your efforts, particularly with the homeless shelter, was very eye-opening, and it really brought the crisis to the well, forefront. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Do we serve together? What's that? How, uh, do we serve together? No, no. I, just, I, no I just got here three years ago. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Savino. Thank you, uh, Senator Young. Thank you. Uh, can I call you Scott? It's easier than Comptroller yeah. Stringer. <laughs> my tongue. Um, I want to pick up um, where Assemblyman McDonald left off on the pension yeah, issue. I know that um, part of the problem with the city having to put up another $600 million is basically the actuarial assumption is somewhat wrong. You know, we're dealing with a system that was designed at a time when 55 was old and 65 was dead, and unfortunately, our retirees are living longer than we assume they would. So I'm gonna assume that's going to be a problem going forward. 
So what steps? I kind of hope that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's likely. You know, people are living longer, and they're going to be continuing to collect pensions. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some way for the system to adapt to that so that we don't have these shortfalls. Is there something that you guys are working on now that will help, or help deal with that? I see Tim is writing furiously there. What do you mean? So uh, Tim Mulgan, who's our excellent deputy controller for budget, who I probably forgot to introduce, but everyone knows him so well because you call him all the time, and he's did a great. <laughs> he served the city, so thank you, Tim. Um, in this new, um, in in the new tables that um, the actuary has issued, a lot of future growth is built mm -hmm. into the table. Tim reminds me, so I think that's helpful. But. You know, we're going to have to think about retirement beyond the pension. Sure. And we have to think about retirement, not just for people who are city or state workers. And mm -hmm. we are collaborating to come up with ways to create retirement plans for every citizen, every, uh, you know, every, everybody in this country that can have a secure retirement. Well, I, I totally agree. I know the governor has a proposal on it. I have a piece of legislation that would um, allow for it. And I've often uh, said that Many people would have a pension, and many employers would provide pensions if they could afford you know, to maintain a plan. It's incredibly expensive to develop one. And I do think that we are probably missing out on the opportunity for small employers, or even medium-sized ones, to utilize <coughs> the New York City or New York State pension system as a vehicle of investment, separating the funds, of course, to protect the taxpayer. But it's something that we really need to look at. So let me, without, without letting the cat out of the bag, we, we have been researching and working on this issue with experts from literally around the world mm -hmm. on this issue and um, give me some time uh, we need some many months but uh, we are working with a lot of folks and obviously mm -hmm. you've talked about this uh, to come up with a retirement plan that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the other, on, on the pension issue, I mean, the New York Times has the report uh, or an article about the report that was released today, the independent one. But their headline is rather alarming to the average individual. Which one? I'm sorry. It says, New York City's pension system in danger of operational failure. Now, to the average reader, that might seem like there's some sort of crisis impending the pension system, but I don't believe that's the case. I, what my understanding is, it's a couple of things they've uncovered. One, uh, something we've known for a long time that the money managers that operate within the pension system have been taking millions of dollars in fees and not really producing anything. And that there's also this issue of the Bureau of Asset Management. So I know your predecessor, um, John Liu and, the, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg at one point talked about restructuring the B Bureau of Asset Management, but that plan never went anywhere well, let me, because of let me just, opposition from the funds. So have so you it, been able to it, overcome little, that opposition? Little, so it's a little different. So there was a Liu Bloomberg plan to consolidate the pension mm -hmm. fund. Uh, it was a very it was a plan that had very little support up mm -hmm. in Albany and was never going to happen. We worked for two years with the trustees to create a of plan, uh, uh, an opportunity to align the five boards in one investment meeting. Before we were able to accomplish this, we used to have 55 investment meetings a year, mm -hmm. talking about 96% of the same investments. It was out of a bad movie, and it grinded down the Bureau of Asset Management, so the people who were responsible for looking at deals and investments only were preparing for the next meeting to have the same discussion all over again. We work with our trustees and our union partners. Mm -hmm. We work with the mayor, public advocate, borough presidents, and we now have six meetings a year, not 55, which has now given us a lot more time to tackle the issues related to the Bureau of Asset Management. When I took office, I said, look, a lot of BAM is hanging by a thread because we haven't invested in infrastructure, we haven't invested in uh, IT, we haven't invested in a whole host of things. When I became controller, there was no compliance officer in a $160 billion pension fund. There wasn't a risk management officer, a risk officer, to review the investments the CIO was making. We still had pay to play in the pension system. We never banned placement agents. We had a six point plan, we accomplished it, but then I realized we have to go deeper. And this is where sometimes, and today's story in the Times, the headline is a little chilling, but I hired an outside consulting firm 
uh, with the trustees, $1.4 million report that I think is very telling, that says we accomplished a lot in the last two years, but if you want to have best practice pension fund, you've got to do finish the job over the mm -hmm. next two to six to ten years. We release that because it's transparent. You get a report, you put it out for public consumption. I want people to feel there's a sense of urgency. I want, as controller, to be held to that standard, that urgency, and I want the person who comes after me to feel that the Funston report is what you take to work in the morning mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a pension fund. So I am not upset. About, I thought there was a great article. Mm -hmm. It talked about the report we did on Wall Street fees, challenging these money managers to recognize it's not just about them, but they actually represent retirees and public dollars. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're in an era of great reform within the controller's office and with the pension fund. And I do want to say on the record, because sometimes the elected official gets more notoriety about it. True, you get more blame. Mm -hmm. But I think people uh, should really thank the, the trustees of police, fire, uh, nicers, uh, teachers. The, they have been as, as reform-minded as anyone at the pension fund. Well, it's very good to hear that. And finally, um, on your new responsibility of administering the state's homeless I don't know, $20 billion. Do you have a sense of what your role will be separate and apart from what you currently do right now? As a city controller, you have the ability to audit contracts, and you've been very aggressive about that with some of these bad actors in the shelter system, refusing to approve contracts until they clean up their act. So what will be different about what, what we're, the governor's budget would grant to you than you're currently doing? So this is not an Al Haig moment for me, mm -hmm. okay? This is what we're doing is what I've been doing from the very beginning, mm -hmm. which is auditing city agencies. We've been very aggressive with Department of Homeless Services. You know, we exposed the weakness in the contracting system. We got blowback from DHS. Turns out we were right. There were issues. We went into the shelter system, did a hard-hitting audit, and we revealed the terrible conditions people were living in. Imagine living with rodents, mm -hmm. infestation, doors that don't lock or close, security nowhere in sight, uh, repairs that were so terrible. Denny, it, it's, it's from back in the days of, of the 70s when there was redlining and you, know, and you would go to court with tenants in terrible conditions. This is, the, this is what kids are living with, 23,000 children. It is so outrageous uh, that, that I, I sometimes can't stop myself. But we are grateful. I am grateful that the governor in his state of the state message said, you know what, we're willing, I'm willing to give you resources if you need it. I'm, I want to coordinate with Controller DiNapoli, Controller Schroeder, and your office, so that if we've seen dire conditions, that we can take strong action. In addition to the governor working with us on this, we are also working with the mayor, and we're working with Commissioner Banks. Because at the end of the day, my goal as the auditor-in-chief of our city is to make sure that by the time we're done, that these shelters are going to be places where a child can stay, still get an education, have room to study, have a place to play. This is the 21st century, people. This should not be that difficult. And we're going to continue to do it. And listen, we're ruffling feathers. Mm -hmm. We're pushing the city administration. This is, this is obviously something that they've got to get their arms around. But we're pushing, and that's what my job is. I am glad the governor is committed to this process. It is not a negative. It is important. We should support that effort. And you should also have assurance from me that we are working with uh, Steve Banks, who's someone I respect, an HRA commissioner. We have had multiple meetings. We talk on the phone all the time. And we are collaborating. And I want you to know that as well. Well, that's, that's great. I just wanted one final point. I made the uh, point earlier when I spoke to the mayor about the history of DHS as a separate agency from HRA. You know, we're all old enough now. We were there. I remember Muzzy Rosenblatt, the original commissioner who convinced the previous mayor. Uh, they claimed then it would make uh, services, service provision easier or better for the homeless. In fact, it was really just a ploy to privatize the shelter system. And as a result, now you're, you're auditing thousands of contracts for these private shelter operators, and many of them, as you pointed out, are running um, shelters that are not fit for uh, humans. 
So one of the things I would hope you would focus on is also looking at the number of these private shelters that are contracted by the city that are not abiding by the rules that say sex offenders should not be living in a place where you have children. They do it all the time. They've taken the position that they can't prevent it because if a <coughs> family comes into a family shelter system and they're part of the family unit, that they can't prevent a, even a level three sex offender from coming in with his, with his family. We believe that that's wrong. Um, and we would look, to, hopefully your agency and your office will you know, get a handle on that in a way DHS has refused to do up until now. Well, look, we would love to be able to um, collaborate with you on, on, a lot, on a lot of these issues. I think um, it's, not, it's not new power or old power you have. If there's a will to get into these shelters and find out what's going on, find out, hold these operators accountable, look at these cluster sites. Look, one of the things that we expose that I just find incredible, uh, with a link voucher, you can go and get an apartment, right? The link voucher program is very significant. There are landlords that won't rent to homeless people. I mean, it's, it's, it's in violation, it's a violation of the law, and it shouldn't be allowed, and we should crack down on that. Um, people who want to find permanent housing ought to have the ability to do that, especially if they have a voucher that means to pay for affordable housing, but the landlord says no homeless need apply. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, that is something that, that we have to be very, very tough on. At the same time, we have to be very tough to make sure that communities are consulted in the siting of facilities. We have to involve communities. We shouldn't be afraid of communities. When I was a borough president, I cited homeless facilities, working with different administrations. When you talk to people with respect in a community, when you engage people, you'd be surprised how much people want to help. When you tell people that there are 23,000 children in our homeless shelter today in the greatest city on earth, and at, at a time of some you know, prosperity in the city, people get very emotional. We have the will of the people on our side to clean up the shelters, and that means we should be funding initiatives by the governor and the mayor to create a permanent housing, supportive housing. We have got to create a revenue stream for NYCHA because at the end of the day, we have got to make sure that housing is strong or we could tip that housing mm -hmm. into Ill disrepair, and we'll be doing those kind of audits uh, looking for children who are living in dangerous conditions. And I don't want to see that happen at all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Assemblyman? Assemblyman Oates. Hi, uh, Comptroller. I, I just, uh, I know Assemblyman McDonald and Senator Savino both uh, talked some about the uh, a retirement system, and I just wanted to add a little bit into um, the 600 million. Is that all due increase? Is that all due to the actuarial, or is is that somewhat also? I know there was a little bit of maybe down performance uh, from the year before. So it's all, all of that 600 million is about assumptions. There's no performance factored into that. So the, the total amount of increase, do you know, then that 600 million, is there an increase year to year anticipated to, or don't we have those figures yet? That, that performance piece was phased in, in our November plan. I don't, I don't have it with me, but I can get it for you. Okay, I, I was just trying to get an idea. If, I mean, over the last several years, are we seeing year to year going up each year? I know in some of the statewide uh, the ERS and some of the systems, we've seen some decline in the percentages that are paid due to performance and whatever. So, so in, our, in our situation, I, I wouldn't say we've gone up. We've, we've actually started to flatten out over the last couple of years. Okay, and, and I'd appreciate uh, seeing some of those figures. Thank yeah, you no, very much. I'd be happy to provide them. Thank you very much. Senator Rivera. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, controller, good afternoon. I have a, a couple of questions for you uh, uh, regarding Medicaid. Now, I, obviously, I, I, I recognize that we all recognize that the budget that we have before us is a working draft. So obviously, these budget hearings are precisely about looking uh, for input to figure out the places where we could make the, do some shifts and, and, and do things in a smarter way. Uh, but I wanted to ask you at least the numbers that we have right now. We, uh, we covered it yesterday in the Medicaid hearing, but I wanted to uh, as the fiscal watchdog of the City of New York, uh, there is many of us that are concerned uh, with the way that the formula on Medicaid has been, at least currently in the, in the budget proposal, has been uh, re, 
uh, organized, if you will, for the City of New York and the impact that it's going to have on it. So if you could speak a little bit about the fiscal impact that if the budget proposal stays. Oh, here he is. This guy. I love this guy. He appears like a ninja. I don't know where this guy. Um, the, um, the, so, but if you could speak about the, the, the fiscal impact this could have on the City of New York, certainly in, the, in, in this, this coming fiscal year and in years to come, and, and whether you think that that is a sustainable thing, considering that, uh, that some folks have said that the your, well, I, your I, broad I, shoulders of the State of New York can, can I, I appreciate your leadership on this issue, and you've been, I mean, championing our, our cause here. And you know, the numbers that we can give, give you is that you know, the hit starts 2017, 300 million dollars. It goes up to 500 million in 18. Then you know, it, it just doesn't stop. It gets to 2020, and now we're suddenly, as I mentioned in our testimony, at 735 million dollar hit. Uh, you know, that that accumulation over the next few years is over two billion dollars, and so this is something that ought to be avoided at all costs. I understand that you know the governor, the mayor, are talking about efficiencies. I always believe that you can sort of you can save money when you look at ways to you know to come up with you know new technology, new ways. But at the end of the day, we cannot um, we, we cannot uh, you know that that Medicaid cost would hurt us very badly. So it is your sense that it, it, and certainly you are experienced as well through all the uh, audits that you and your office do on how to spot inefficiencies, probably. Not, not only certainly in some cases, you know, inappropriate use of money, but certainly in, in certain places where things could be done more effectively and more efficiently. It is your sense then that this, could, this is not a cost that could be just I, I burdened think, by the city? I think our health system in New York City is in, a, is in a precarious situation. And we obviously, you know, we, we have a lot of people in the system who are not covered uh, by insurance. We have a lot of uh, undocumented individuals who have the right to get health care, they should get health care. Uh, this is not the time to to take a hit, especially as the mayor said today, that we're dealing with real budget issues related to the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, we've put $300 million in. I think that's really, a, Tim, you would agree, a stopgap for what has to happen there in terms of figuring out a, 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 an economic system that works there. I'd love to work with your office to get some of the some of the more detailed breakdown. As many of us are arguing that we should certainly shift we'll be ha this uh, this this. Uh, you know, maybe Tim, we could we could dig a little deeper. We could get some more numbers to you, um, and you know, talk about the different areas. I think we do have to spend some time thinking about the Health and Hospitals Corporation as well. I immensely appreciate it. Thank, yeah, thank you. you, Senator. I'm good. Anybody else? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Farrell. Thank you, yes, Senator. Yes, is your snow is your block snowed out? Or snowed uh, in? Seventy <laughs> first street. Is it can I go there on Friday? Let me, let, let me the mayor took care of my street. Careful how you answer that one. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice meeting you, Scott. When did you leave the assembly? Was it 2012? Well, yeah, I just came in the same team today. Thank you again. Here we go. Let's go.